from Dolly, took her away. There's also another that Dolly's lover took her away. Um, but the fact that there's, there's a sense of, of desertion and a desperation in the way that this is written, that it's, um, he feels betrayed, he feels that Dolly left him, but there's a longing in, in reading this, um, this letter. Um, we also see images that were used um, of other women, but this image here of Lion Tong Thu, um, he was a, um, he, worked, he, he worked for, quote, the Confederacy in terms of the aspect of he was owned by, um, by a man by the name of James Bethune. He lived in Virginia and South Carolina and traveled in Georgia for the Confederate Army to raise money for during the Civil War. Um, he his, he was, had been with the family since he was four years old. So he played uh, benefits and, and, and the Confederate Army raised a lot of money um, based on the line time of food. And so it's, it's just a fascinating and amazing story to see um, this um, boy genius um, musician pose, but also raising money. Um, and then after, his, he was never freed by his, by his owner. When he died, he passed his, his uh, he passed him over to, signed him over to his daughter. So he continued within the family. So just ending with uh, some other images that I, I just found just striking when finding you know, black figures in um, the background and stories related to, to them. I, I'm going to just go through, just to tie into a, a, a few, two photographers, Wendell White and Willie Williams, who are actually going through looking and finding Civil War sites, burial sites we are unfamiliar with, what I am, uh, specifically in New Jersey, uh, Port Republic, New Jersey, where black families maintain um, burial grounds um, and monuments and they reenactments in, in New Jersey, Port uh, Republic, New Jersey. And then uh, Willie Williams, he is interested in finding these sites and go traveling through the South and looking for, um, in Brownsville, Texas, also in Oklahoma, burial sites, and then also battlegrounds. And so this stays alive in this active voice of the memory of creating stories about black soldiers and their invisibility and making them, and making them visible today. circulated and, and shaped, you know, our popular perceptions and popular opinion, both in the past and in the present. Uh, the changing meanings through history, certainly, in, the, in those, uh, in, in that uh, carte de visite itself that, uh, that Tony showed, and questions of authenticity, as well as the language, uh, what, what is the language of, of photography, both in the past and in the present? What are, what are people, what are people seeing? Um, and Mala's, of course, about the, the use of photography and propaganda um, as propaganda, uh, and, and and also the the this interesting question about the confusions of race and both uh, sympathy and threat in, in, 
in the images, and, and Deb's discussion of, of black soldiers, the sort of visibility and invisibility of, of black soldiers in photography. So, uh, which is, a, you know, a, a horrendous simplification of what each of you said, but I just wanted to touch on a few, a few of the themes. Um, what I, I guess what I, I, I wanted to, to, to do was, was to dig a little deeper in some of the things that you had raised. Um, and maybe we could just start off, um, and then you know, everybody should uh, should uh, should jump in on this. But uh, just beginning uh, uh, with what Deb was discussing with in terms of black soldiers, I, I, I was very struck when when you were um, when you were talking about the distinctions between, I guess you could say, uh, public pictures versus private pictures or, or photographs taken for public purposes. And, and those pri private, particularly thinking of Frederick Douglass, is very you know, clear uh, awareness about this. You know, before the uh, before the Civil War, and uh, I I wondered what your your thoughts were about whether there were tensions about this. How, if indeed were, for example, the private photographs something that was circulated after the war, as in other words, more about the legacy of the of the war, or indeed did it have an act did it have an active role in public consciousness? I, I believe that um, it happened in, in, in both, in terms of occupying the space, that the images of, of black men were seen as stereographed images or stereotypical caricatures. So they were rarely seen as, as, as men who contributed to their own freedom. And so the images, for me, were popular, um, popularized by posing, and that they were the, the poses were coded in aspects of manhood, and that they became much more popular after the war, um, shared and reproduced, and, and used um, by family members and also in classrooms. So they circulated within black communities while the images of blacks as dehumanized images of blacks circulated in the larger community. So these images circulated in in different spaces. So they occupied, there was a sense of desire for men to be seen as you know, upstanding citizens and, and who were part of their freedom. So that's kind of a new way of you know, new vision. I mean, I think that's an interesting point, but I think it also speaks to who paid for the pictures and how they were made. Because it struck me, looking at the portraits you showed, but most of those were probably made for the soldiers themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and many of them looked to be tin types or amber types. So they were singular images. And the soldier, the black soldier would have walked into a studio, handed the person the money, and, and gotten that picture to take home. And you know, lucky for you that you later found it in an archive. Whereas the stereos like that Tony showed were always made for commercial purposes and were always made for wide distribution. So um, I think you've established two really interesting kinds of photographs. And I think they always had different origins, I would guess. Um, and then, you know, they're only really being brought together into a single argument right now. And different, I assume, different ways, different circulate, different ways of circulating. I mean, the, the, and I guess that, that's something that that um, touches on everybody's uh, talks about. Well, indeed, how did these circulate? Um, I mean. Molly mentioned, of course, propaganda, of course, and, and, and I'm, as a good example, certainly, obviously, we know that, as, as, as Tony raised, the carte de visite is, is a, a means for circulation. But uh, the daguerreotype you showed in the big beginning, for example, well, how, how did that have any impact beyond that singular image itself? Well, Sonner did his best. He, he wanted to make sure, he had several different poses taken. I've only found one, but the chief note had more than one taken. Um, and he tried to circulate that one photograph to get it into as many people's hands as he could, but that was the limitation of the mid-1850s rather than having the, the carte de visite. Um, I found evidence that um, people that tried to do um, reproductions of some of these pictures to, to lesser effect, was it crystallotype? I don't know if you're familiar with that. Um, which in some way of trying to copy these images, but they were just very limited in the 1850s in terms of what they could do. But in terms of circulation, we know that the photo 
photograph was at the Massachusetts State House. So you could come by and look at it. And in letters between Sumner and John Andrew, who was not yet the governor, um, he says it's always out. I can't, you know, people are always coming by to look at it, which makes it a really interesting object in itself, that it is something of such interest that people are hanging it around um, because they can't really reproduce it at that point. Well, if we're, ju if we're juxtaposing uh, for example, when Marty showed the uh, the engravings of the photographs versus the photographs, were were, were the engra were engravings a, a, a means, the lithographs as a means before the part of the disease was available? Not for these particular images. I have no evidence that they made any engravings of these these images. I don't think they had. I mean, they didn't. Have, they didn't quite have the appeal of the scores back or the or the the audience yet. I mean, again, it was just was so new and that Sumner even thought to have her picture made and try to distribute it was just a new, a new direction entirely, I think. Um, and then the, the carbon disease that come later, I, I think those must have come because they knew about this picture, although I don't have any evidence yet. They knew about this little girl who toured around. Um, and I guess there's, there's an important dynamic here, at least with those pictures, between the photograph of the children and the children themselves. Um, that, that, one probably reinforced the other. The people people would go and see them and then buy their photographs. And we have evidence of that. Do you think, I'm, don't, I don't want to belabor this point, but um, in light of, let's say, for example, the, the Amistad, um, you know, mutineers, and, the, uh, and of course the, uh, the Jocelyn painting and its reproductions as, as both engravings. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, I, I find it interesting that, that children the children, the, the portraits of the children didn't become a uh, uh, the same sort of you know rallying or for that matter even commercial po commercial possibilities. Like well, there was for the for the Civil War era part of the disease. I take that back. There was an engraving made of the whole group. Uh -huh, right. Um, there, that, that we can right. um, that reference. But uh, the individual portraits haven't seen. Um. But that, but that said, I mean, there were a million copies of these photographs, so someone was buying them. So, uh, moving into you know this this question of I guess you know, I'm curious about the, the changing meanings uh, that, uh, that that Tony demonstrated in, in um, uh, and authenticity questions of authenticity in in, in the Carta Vizic you show the the this question about the, the language of photography. Um, uh, I mean, uh, uh, you made that really interesting point about the, the sort of language of belatedness that's embedded into the into the photograph uh, of, of aftermath. Um, you know, that said, um, the it seems it seems to me that, for example, the the, the photograph of the of the two kids um, is carrying some sort of narrative. What that narrative is, obviously, we're finding hard to determine, but I guess that's one of the, 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 the issues that I'm curious about in terms of the language, and for that matter, the, the, the photographs during the war, um, how much uh, recognizing uh, the stillness factor, the, you know, the, um, the non-motion aspect of this, um, can we assume that uh, viewers at the time, and maybe the problem is that we can either assume or know, uh, have a certain familiarity with what a still image is and what it portrays that either photographs defy or they are trucking in to some extent, either successfully or unsuccessfully. I guess I'm, I'm trying to dig in a little deeper about how much we can define in terms of what that language is. What, as you were saying, what, what indeed is the impact of these photographs? Okay. Uh, yeah. Well, I think what Marnie says is right on that photographs um, cannot be necessarily understood within the language of photography only to somehow arrive at an understanding of the impact of its language. Um, if we were to compare it with other visual cultural elements, and in fact the Civil War is not only a wordy war, like people write about it a lot, it's a visual war where people have all kinds of things associated, and not necessarily just the photographs, the lithographs, drawings, um, caricatures on musical sheets. It's a very, very visual war. And in that sense, I suppose um, my, my reading of the photographs as particularly still and particularly fraught with a kind of 
motionlessness that is a weighted motionlessness is measured against all this other visual stuff in circulation. Now, uh, there are these one, uh, Marty showed some wonderful scenes of, of the manipulation of what illustrators do to photographs. Uh, um, there are some wild things that are out there, you know, photographs of stilled battlefields or bridges that suddenly, in an illustrator's hand, have troops marching across bridges, right, and bodies strewn all over the place. And so I, my, my sense is that in that comparison, uh, um, there's a kind of, uh, there's a kind of um, power given to the photograph in precisely its stillness. I suppose, too, that this is, um, and, I, and I'm projecting quite a bit here, right, uh, and it's, it's sort of the art historical uh, uh, imperative, um, is that in the, in the practice of photography, a photographer is out, out there on the field and is laboring and laboring and laboring, and there is some sense, for those of you who have ever held up a camera, right, that you're after certain kinds of things. And here are photographers who are laboring day after day after day with the sense that they're always late. They're always late. <laughs> uh, and it's not, I don't think, for them, it's a debilitating feeling. I mean, that, that's the practice of photography. But it's a practice of photography that is constantly and always being measured by the other full forms of newsworthiness that are being offered to an interesting, interesting public. Uh, what do photographers do? They're not only late, but then they send their images back with couriers to newspapers who then gussy up the images, which only makes their original seem even later <laughs> because the images are, are transformed into something I'm not sure if I'm answering your question. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I think the other thing to remember here is that photography is really new. And we're talking about a period that's only 20 to 25 years after the invention of photography. And we, we, we grew up with photographs. When we look at a photograph, we tend to think we understand an array of ways to understand it and to embrace it or to attach stories to it. But I actually, you know, in the 1840s and 50s, just before the Civil War, photographs were sometimes confusing to people. Like, what are they? They can't explain events like prints can. Um, it's, it, they don't compete with novels. They don't describe a landscape as well as a map or a scientific drawing. So I think what makes the 1860s so interesting here is that this is a moment when people are still trying to figure out how you do interpret these things. And I think, you're right, Tony, they're, they're interpreting them you know, against all these other kinds of things. And I think it's very hard for us to go back and recover that kind of 1860s mindset. I mean, I think the words that are often attached to these pictures are really one of our best clues for getting at how people encountered them in the marketplace. And that's what makes your example so interesting, because different sets of words could be applied to the same picture. Um, you know, for the pictures that, that you were showing, Deborah, it's, it's so hard to know. I mean, I think we can interpret these poses in a particular way now, but it is so hard to go back to the 1860s and understand what those tintypes meant, meant when people brought them home to their families. Um, and I think we have to ask whether any reading of ours has to be, is necessarily a historical. And um, if, you know, if you find a letter that talks about a picture, you're really lucky. But those are really hard to come across. Yeah, and, but, but some of the responses are based on Frederick Douglass's words, as well as his the letters. There's a wonderful letter, a book by uh, Pamela Luker, who um, is looking at letters from Black America and as a talk about the experience of going to the photography studio and what they wanted to impart in the poses. Well, I like the, the idea that it's not just us laboring to interpret these photographs, but that these were narratives, the stories that people are trying to tell and going to the studio in the first place. Where a certain uniform right, to pose in a certain way. Um, and I too with the propaganda to tell, they're very clearly trying to tell a story about life, skin, 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 skin. So a, a significant aspect of this, we can say certainly, for example, in terms of the, the, the personal photograph, is that is, is the uh, is actually the experience of being photographed. I mean that, that I mean it's new to a, to a great extent, and it's probably a singular event I mean, for for many of these people, and I guess. Uh, in some opportunities, I guess they're you know traveling photographers because the majority of the photographs they took were portraits, or at least that's one argument. But I'm struck by that as a 
an aspect that perhaps hasn't been talked about enough, the, the, the subject's experience. Um, and indeed, your, your thoughts about how much the subject controlled the image. I mean, I, we know that Frederick Douglass was very concerned about that, but how much this was, uh, was as you could say, was a like common time. <coughs> There's a way in which one wants to read the photographs as, um, uh, in, uh, as, as always already framed by the, the studio and the lens of the photographer, and therefore to rob the sitter of any kind of agency. And you have to look very, very hard for those moments of agency in the photograph. And there are many ways of being able to get at that. Text is certainly one way, but text is not in any way source or a reliable source itself. Another way is to somehow compare photograph to photograph to photograph and try to find the tiny changes in a studio's language. And you hope those changes have symbolic meaning and you hope those changes are the result of a certain kind of agency on the part of the sitter. But even then, it's quite speculative. Really, you know? So it's a, it's a matter of really cross-referencing in all kinds of ways. And then, you know, um, in the art historian matter, I guess I'm the only art historian here, so I can sort of say this, but, you know, um, uh, um, if, if all you're left with then is photographs, there's nothing that prevents you from making claims about it, right? Uh, if that's the only record you have, then it cannot remain in her. You know, that's, that, the, the option is to have it remain in her, and that's not what you want it to do. You have to sort of make some, you're licensed to make claims on those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. Not if you're a historian. Not if you're a historian. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's a different life. But, but, here's, <laughs> but here's a letter that was sent back to um, a man who sent a um, photograph back to his family. He said he had left his home a slave, but had returned in the garb of a Union soldier, free a man. And that's that was in the letter that he sent. So in, in imagining what it meant from becoming the vision of a slave to free in a man. I think that I was just looking for one of his letters. Yeah. Um, so, when are claims, when are the, I mean, at this point in time, in 2011, getting to 2012, uh, there's a, an abundance, as, as we've been discussing, of photographs, and photographs is the authentic image of the war. Um, when are claims about that beginning? I mean, what, 10 years after the war, what are the, what, what are the claims vis-a-vis -vis uh, the photographs of the Civil War. What are they 20 years after? What are I mean, is this a changing? Is this, is, is this a moving target? I think it's a moving target. Um, we, you know, we know that Brady, um, he ended up selling uh, during an auction, I think, the War Department. He couldn't sell it to the con Congress, wouldn't buy it. And then the War Department bought a lot, bought, you know, I think it was 10,000 of them. We are offered um, 2,600. Dollars and then, you know, so it changed each time. You know, right after the war, he couldn't get anyone interested in, in the war because everybody wanted it over with and forgotten. So now we're back again with the value of these images. There's a wonderful a moment in the 1890s, and I'm reminded of it regularly because I live in New England, and New England is crazy about this moment in the 1890s where the war is remembered again. And if you've ever wandered to New England towns, you'll come to the common every town, and there's the same stupid soldier and a sculpture in every single town, right? And that's, those are all from the 1890s. Mm -hmm. And that's that moment of a recovery of kind of this, mm -hmm. of this show of nationalism mm -hmm. um, among competing groups of constituents who probably would not have shared much 20 years before. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's at that moment, to answer your question, Josh, that at least in my <coughs> sense, photographs take on a new life. Again, take on a, a very, very big life, and then uh, and become objects of of, of sometimes simple history, uh, but also objects that already wear the patina of a past that really can't be recovered in a way. Um, and I, 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 there are elements of that earlier, certainly, but by the 1890s, that's my sense. But to pick up on Marty's point, I mean, I think historians still don't use the photographs. Waiting for that point at which it becomes sort of integrated 
bold between text and, and photographs in a way that I'm doing that for. But I also took from your question, maybe I'm misreading something about the with authenticity questions of, of whether the photographs themselves were authentic or mm -hmm. staged and that, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and I know, I mean, in, in the case of these photographs, I mean, people were accusing um, uh, Mary Goss of being a fake <laughs> in 1850. Um, and, um, and that's based on her photograph. So, you know, I don't know. Um, there's trickery from the beginning. I, don't, I think we often think of the 19th century audiences. I think it's true that a lot of us thought the photographs might have been evidence of the truth. You could do science through photography, that, that sort of thing. But I think people are also really aware that just like anything else, it could be an illusion staged for political purposes. And they weren't, everybody wasn't naive about that. Even before Photoshop. Yeah. yeah. Um, I see by the clock on the wall, we should give some time for members of the audience to ask questions and queries. Well, I, I'm interested as an art historian. Oh, sure. Thank you. Uh, I'm Elizabeth Anderson. I teach art history at Harvard and Columbia. Um, and I'm interested in uh, an issue that I, I think comes up for art historians that the historians haven't addressed but gets to this uh, problem that Marnie is raising, and it's, a, it's the question of genre. right? So the genre of portraiture um, is very easy one to translate into photography. And so people know how to read um, a portrait. And they don't necessarily know how to read these other photographs that come out of the Civil War, partially because they don't quite fit any existing genre. We don't know what to call them. Are they history? Are they genre painting? Um, and in fact, um, when you say that not every kind of picture is made of the Civil War, I think it's partially because the pictures that are made are being influenced by those prints. So we're not only competing with prints, but we're also having prints dictate the kinds of parameters and paradigms that the photographers can act in in a way that's legible. So that's, I think, you know, I'm, I'm a big believer in Trackenberg's argument for the sentimentality of the scenes um, that turn up in the sketchbook being very much creating domestic spaces out of bunkers. Um, because we have genre paintings that are all about domestic spaces, and we don't necessarily have an ability in, um, in uh, photography to, to forge new genres that are going to get any press um, with viewers. So I think it's a really interesting observation that you're making, and, and it's also interesting that photography doesn't come into acceptance as a whole. It comes into acceptance in different <coughs> formats at, at different paces. But the other thing that I was thinking about as you were talking about um, the... Uh, the um, subject's uh, control or participation in their portraiture. And forgive me for being very indulgent, but um, my great-great-great-grandfather ran away from high school to go fight in the Civil War, and he had his picture taken constantly. And the letters that he sent home, every three or four weeks, uh, he grew a mustache, he got a haircut, he got a change in his uniform, he had his picture taken. But for him, it was coming into the Civil War and coming into photographic space were simultaneous. And I think we need to understand that for many of these individuals, they, they never would have been photographed before the Civil War. And the opportunity to be photographed as a participant in the Civil War is a moment of identity making. And I, I say this partially because Tony was saying we should look for difference and, and the individuality of these portraits. But I think for many of these individuals, they wanted to look the same. They wanted to look like a soldier and the opportunity to create a permanent record of them in a uniform, right, matching everybody else with the same stuff, was, um, was a moment of self-making that's very different from the way in which we now think about photographs having to distinguish us all as having an individual identity. I mean, I, I guess my pictures are different from everyone yes. so else. And, I, and I, what I think is interesting about them is that they sort of, um, they use people's expectations about the portrait in order mm -hmm. to upend their expectations, right? They, they sort of just sort of radically use a convention. Yeah. Which are, I think, very accessible. I mean, if there, right. aren't, if there aren't manuals about how to understand other genre in the 1860s, we already have Marcus Aurelius Root. We already have a century of comportment manuals that tell you exactly how to pose to look dignified or respectable or maternal or whatever. So yes, absolutely, a very legible manipulation. I think, you, I, I think th thought you made a couple of really great points there. 
and I, I think you're absolutely right about the absence, uh, our photography's inability to capture particular genres. History painting. Mm -hmm. I mean, think think about how wars in American history have been depicted in the past. You can think of the grand, you know, sure. paintings of the death of General Wolfe, or you can think of the elaborate uh, uh, lithographs and paintings of the Mexican War. Whoa, they really came up short-handed in the Civil War. You just simply couldn't do that with a photograph. And so I think you made a good point there. Um, in terms of the portraiture, I think this is another moment where it's really useful to think not just that people understood how to pose for portraits because the manuals of, of popular literature, but to think about this moment in the mid-19th century. I mean, this is basically the first time in the history of mankind where you can go away from your family and communicate with your family about what you look like. So it's, it's something that we see in this country first during the gold rush when people go out to California and they are ecstatic to be able to send pictures home that make them look like gold miners. People go dress up like cowboys because they want to show their, their family they can look like cowboys. And I think you make a really great point that Civil War portraits fit into that, that genre. And I think another opportunity for historians is that nobody has really looked at how sentiment changes at this particular moment. Like what does it mean to be part of the first generation of Americans um, that can not only know what a beloved brother or husband or son looks like once they've moved away, but the first generation of Americans who knows what a grandfather who mm -hmm. died relatively young in a war looked like. Um, so if any graduate students are looking for other projects, <laughs> I, I think that's a fantastic one because nobody has looked at the impact of portrait photography on American families at this time. And certainly Civil War pictures provide ample opportunity for that. Um, here's a specific question for my students, from my students. I teach a course, a survey course of journalism history. I show them the Brady Studios photographs of the Civil War era. I show them the posing and the faking and the moving of the bodies on the battlefield. And being good journalism students, they get horrified and upset. You know, oh my God, they, they should have been fired. Um, how did people at the time feel about that? Did they know? Did they know to think in those terms? If they knew that these were manipulated photographs, did it upset them? Or was this simply photographs that gave you a sense of what the battlefield looked like and that's what you wanted? I'm not sure, and I would love to talk to Well, we're on the um, realm of interpretation, I think, again. But um, my sense is that you know the, the reference for the, the dead body that might make contemporary viewers a little picky about the manipulation of bodies was not a reverence that necessarily existed in the 19th century. I mean, as, as an example, there are so many photographs of recently deceased children who have been gussied up in all kinds of ways, right? And who are made to look as if they're reading something have just played a game, or uh, and, and that there's a kind of life and death, uh, and that the studio space becomes a space where the body cannot be necessarily defiled in this movement, but um, um, manipulated in a particular way. My, my sense is that um, had the, the viewers of, say, Gardner's um, uh, Sharpshire's last uh, home understood that those bodies, that body had been moved, would not necessarily have been talked by them in any particular way. Um, uh, the, the same for you know the, the series of, of, of bodies in the Antietam uh, field where the bodies are lined up but prepared for burial. Mm -hmm. That's clearly a manipulated, uh, um, organized mm -hmm. scene here. Um, that helps probably answer the question. It, 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 what, I mean, it addresses reverence. What, it, what I'm still wondering about is the question of authenticity and the expectations of authenticity. Nice. Well, I, 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 as far as I know, people really weren't sure that those bodies were moved until William Presidio yeah. wrote, published his books in the 1970s. Mm -hmm. So I absolutely don't think that the century <coughs> viewers would have been aware, as our students now are, yeah. thanks to us, yeah. that those bodies had been moved. I think that's only within the last 30 or 40 years that that's been understood. Yeah. But if they had been. But I also want to say that none of those bodies are identified. Yeah. You can look, think of all the Civil War dead photographs that you've seen. As far as I know, we can't put a name to a single one. Hmm. And so that also makes it a different kind of conversation about death. It makes it a more metaphoric kind of conversation about death. 
And I also agree with Tony that death, this was different. I mean, people did die at home mm -hmm. in, in the 1860s. And everybody looking at these pictures would have had intimate experience with dead bodies that, that few of us do. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's another one of those moments where it's very hard to recover yeah. that sort of 1860s moment of healing. Yeah. But having said that, the questions I know of authenticity are tied to the uh, Civil War sketch artists. Uh -huh. And that becomes a very, very big issue uh, for not only readers, but soldiers who love <laughs> the illustrated papers still like to make fun of how inaccurate they are at the time. Uh -huh. you know, wrong uniform here, wrong saddle there, or you know, you didn't move into battle that way. To the extent to which some, uh, uh, but then the question becomes, well, what does authentic mean? Yeah. Because for the pictorial press, the notion is, yeah, we were there. We didn't make this up in the, in the office. I know of one instance, <coughs> Um, and this is where one wonders whether this, you know, germinates into another medium of uh, when Alfred Lode, I think it was an Antietam battlefield, he, he did a sketch and there's a, a battlefield surgery right on, uh, you know, in the midst of, of the bodies and he sketched the amputation with the leg facing the, uh, the reader, the viewer. When the engraving was made, the body was turned around and whoa, was really, really pissed. Um, um, and you know, that actually was a big to-do within at least the home office versus the, the sketch artist. Um, I don't know if any photographer ever complained about the way the engraving distorted their, their particular image. But there are other moments. There's another illustrator named Theodore Davis who uh, talked much later, actually, and, and who knows what kind of nostalgia he was talking through as well. But much later he described how he would go about sketching on the battlefield. And he knew that in the course of the events, he could never sketch quickly enough. So he would take these memorandum pages before battle. He would go to the various camps and figure out which general was wearing what uniform and how many stripes they had, right? And then when the battle happened, he would do little stick figures. And afterwards, he would go back and apply what he had learned in the camps onto the stick figures. <laughs> and so there was a level of, of, of um, I, I, um, I don't want to say authenticity, but there's a level of, of, of a sense of, Eyewitnessing mm -hmm. that, that these 